I think we're just going to launch in because I, I, we really don't have time not to, um, because Karen's time's limited. Um, so let's just do introductions. If people come in late, I'm, I'll introduce them at some point, but not right now after I'm done with this, please keep it to like a sentence. <laughs> Because we're going to go really quickly today, or, or at least right now. Uh, Elizabeth, please start us off. Hey, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Morris. I'm the Juvenile Justice Coordinator at DCF, and I work with Tyler Allen, who is the designee for this group. Great. Thank you. Uh, Shalini. Oh, yes. Go ahead. And just, you know, a sentence about who you are, what you sure. do. Sure. Shalini Suryanarayana. I work in, my focus is education and outreach for the State Office of Racial Equity. Thank you. Julio. Julio Thompson, um, Attorney General's Office, um, interim uh, designee for A.G. Clark. Great. Karen, just, you know, you've done this. You've been on this panel. You're muted, okay. my friend. Okay, let me keep going then, right. Jeff, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Jeff Jones, uh, original uh, appointee right. and a retired VSP, amongst other things. Great, thank you. Daniel. Um, oh. Karen's unmuted. I'm unmuted, this took, this took a miracle. <laughs> um, Hi everybody. I met I've met a lot of you because I was actually also a part of the original group. I'm Karen Vastine and I'm the chair of the Council for Equitable Youth Justice and thanks for having me today. Great. Thank you. Daniel. Dan Bennett, Vermont State Police, uh, Deputy Director of the Fern Partial Policing. Thank you. Jessica Jessica Brown, she, her pronouns, a community member appointee to the panel, and I'm from the Vermont Long Graduate School. Great. Laura? Hi, sorry for all the faces. My cat has decided to join the meeting. I'm Laura Carter. I'm a data analyst in the Division of Racial Justice Statistics within the Office of Racial Equity. Great. Thank you. Sheila? And Sheila Linton, she, her, her pronouns, um, community panel member and the Root Social Justice Center. Great. Rebecca? Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner from the Office of the Defender General. Great. Grant. Grant Taylor here taking minutes for the group. Thank you. Chris Loris. Yeah, Christopher Loris, uh, an observer from Rutland. Great. Tiffany North Reed. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm I'm joining from the Office of Racial Equity. Great. And Christine Hughes, hello. Hi, everyone. I'm joining from here in Burlington. Glad to be with you. Great. And she is our inaugural chair, believe it or not. Yep. <laughs> I am. So. Thanks, Ethan. <laughs> sure. It's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> I know. Ah, okay. One more. D Derek, introduce Hi. one sentence. Derek Niedabnik, Department of Corrections. Sorry I'm late. Came out of a meeting. Thanks. I'm going to be Great. off the camera because I'm driving for the next 15 minutes. Got it. Okay. So, um, as you know from the agenda that I sent around uh, yesterday, because it had to be revised, we are having... I'm sorry? Okay. We're having a discussion concerning the Council for Equitable Youth Justice and its relation to the RDAP. And that will begin with Elizabeth with a bit of slides. And then Karen Vastine, who is chair of the council, will uh, take questions and further describe what needs to be described. Elizabeth, okay. take it away. Hey. Um, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Is that Looks accurate? fine. Oh, uh, even better. 
<laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Aton. Um, And I will try to monitor hands, but if anybody has something in the chat, maybe somebody can shout it out. Um, or we can take them all at the end when Karen does her Q&A and I, I hit stop share. Um, so just a little bit of background on Aton had asked, uh, just for some context about the Council for Equitable Youth Justice, uh, we have long been um, around the state, actually for decades, but we were previously under a different name, the Children um, and Family Council for Prevention Programs, which, um, as I'm sure many of you already could tell, was a huge mouthful um, to the council, um, really Karen Bastien leading it uh, went through a statute change very recently. So the Council for Equitable Youth Justice is their new name that you'll see, um, but much of the same slides that I'm gonna show are gonna feel very, um, very much the same from a couple of years ago when I did a similar presentation for you all. Um, so just to start off, um, the council um, is really, um, primarily charged with um, upholding the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act um, and supporting DCF in um, upholding the 33 different core requirements of the law. Uh, this is a long-standing federal law. We are actually um, very excited to say that it's been 50 years officially this year since it was passed by Congress. So what I've shown here is a little bit of a timeline of the original passage in 1974 up until the most recent reauthorization in 2018. Um, and what you'll see here are some really important requirements of the JJDPA um, that I thought it was important for all of you to, to be aware of. So in its original passage in the 70s, it was really focused on separation of juveniles from adult inmates, deinstitutionalization of status offenders. Um, in Vermont, this looks a little different for us because we don't necessarily have staff offenders, but in other states, they'll have delinquency charges for use against things like runaways or truancies, et cetera. So that's what they're referring to when they're talking about status offenders. In 1980, they added removal of juveniles from adult jails or lockups. Then they added in 1988, um, the really crucial core requirement of disproportionate minority confinement. And they have since, um, in every reauthorization added to this and expanded what, what they meant and what they're charging both states and state advisory groups to do. So you'll see in 2022, they changed this slightly to say the disproportionate minority contact. And then in most the most recent reauthorization in 2018, um, they changed this for um, a, a more broad uh, scope of work and they've we're, they now refer to it as racial and ethnic disparities. We um, in Vermont often refer to this as ethnic and racial disparities or ERD. Um, so there, you know, this is a, a little bit of a different um, chart, just re-instituting re, um, those core requirements. Um, and these four different core requirements um, are connected to an annual formula gap from the Department of Justice that DCF receives for participating in the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. Um, so once again, that's racial, addressing racial and ethnic disparities, sight and sound separation, removal from jails and lockups, and deinstitutionalization of status offenders. Um, a little bit more information about uh, this racial and ethnic disparity focus. This is directly from the federal law. Um, states are required to implement policy, practice, and system improvement strategies at the state, territorial, local, and tribal levels as applicable to identify and reduce racial and ethnic disparities among youth who come into contact with the juvenile justice system without establishing or requiring numerical standards or quota. Um, and just to be clear, this is really initiated by our state advisory group, um, which we are very lucky to have a, a wonderful relationship with. Um, a little bit more context, the Department of Justice is really focused on five specific contact points uh, where they see the highest levels of disparities um, nationwide. So those are arrest, diversion, 
pretrial detention, secure confinement, and then transfer to adult court. So I know um, there's been a lot of conversations, especially in the six, past six months or even past couple of years, um, especially, you know, I'm looking at you, Rebecca, uh, where Marshall has mentioned kind of this report that DCF puts out. Um, this is the data that we are charged with gathering and then reporting to the Department of Justice, and that then the council looks at and determines how they can utilize their formula grant um, and overall advocacy in order to reduce those disparities. Um, so a little bit more information about the Council for Equitable Youth Justice. So we re DCF receives this formula grant um, and the council is Vermont State Supervisory Group for purposes of the JJDPA. That means they have um, control over those dollars, how those dollars are procured out, the vast majority of those are procured out to the community. Um, and they're the ones who are creating our ethnic and racial disparity plan, what that looks like. Um, and just some context, the council was actually established by the Vermont legislature in 1986 under the original name. Um, and most recently was reauthorized um, two years ago and we changed the name to Council for Equal Youth Justice. Karen, did you wanna talk at all about the name change? Um, hi, everybody. Um, uh, I, I, I'm happy to, if people um, are interested in that. I mean, I think that uh, Elizabeth's comments about us having an incredible mouthful of words was actually just one of the reasons that we felt it was important to change our name. Um, also, we wanted to represent the work that we are doing. So um, uh, having equitable was a really key word for this group. Um, and the other thing I would share is that with the most recent reauthorization of the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act in 2018, um, there was actually a big shift in how the, the act envisioned what kind of prevention work it would uh, support through these grants. And so um, we specifically um, prevent uh, contact, or that's what we're working on, is specifically preventing contact with the juvenile justice system, which is pretty different than what our previous charge had been in um, you know, 50 years ago, or how, what I'm sorry, 40 years ago, when we were initially created in statute, the focus was actually on more primary prevention. But with the shift in focus to really being on kids um, not having contact with the juvenile justice system, again, it just made sense for us to update our name to reflect um, that different priority, which, which really does align better with our work. Right. Thanks, Karen. Um, so this is a little bit about the work of the council. Um, they do a, a large variety of things, but this is just a little bit of a snapshot um, that Karen's going to talk a little bit more about in detail. But you know, obviously, they receive a formula grant that they ha they have supervisory control over. Um, so you know, we'll put out RFPs pretty frequently. I think some of you might have remembered um, some of the funding that I announced about six months ago related to youth drop-in centers, um, which you know we're we're very happy and um, excited to announce are just starting to get underway from our grants and contracts actually this month. Um, they also recently put out an RFP for a juvenile domestic violence accountability program that's really looking at intimate partner violence um, since there's no current um, services for youth in the state or, or actually not very many services nationally either so it's a really um, a really phenomenal pilot um, that we're looking forward to initiating and in, out of the Hartford Community Justice Center. Um, some other things that they're doing that Karen can talk more about is um, working with a consultant um, this upcoming summer to do some really in-depth anti-racism training and evaluation of the council. In addition, they do a lot of policy advocacy as well that is very re relevant to our death. Um, some of you might remember um, that the JJ section of the RDAS report was really 
kind of inspired by a lot of the topics that the council um, has been bringing up. So speaking of that, um, I'm going to pass it to, to Karen to talk about two of the most relevant initiatives they're working on. Yeah, so thanks, everybody. So um, part of the reason I'm really excited to be with you all today is that I see infinite possibilities for our two councils and your panel to be working together. Um, and we were so proud of the work that you all put into the report. And I know Elizabeth was the author of this um, with respect to um, you know, raising the age of um, juvenile court jurisdiction, the minimum age, sorry, of juvenile court jurisdiction, we call that the floor, uh, to up to the age of 13. This is something we wholly support. Um, and, um, uh, and also you had two recommendations in your report regarding um, addressing the lack of race and ethnicity data within the judiciary. And we are fully in support of that. In, um, and we actually went so far as to um, write a letter of support um, that I would like to share with Martin Lalonde this summer. Um, you know, if you all are interested, I think this could be a really nice way for us to be working together ahead of the next legislative session to see whether or not we could gather some steam ahead of January um, to get some bills that would support the work um, that we we are both prioritizing. So I think this might be the last slide, Elizabeth, right? Okay. <laughs> so um, we just thought, uh, you know, Aton, please feel free to pause, but, uh, you know, Elizabeth and I have been thinking and, um, you know, that once we could present this information to you and help tie um, this work together with a little bit of a visual aid of having both of us in this meeting, um, just if you all have any questions, we're happy to take them today. I think you're on mute. <laughs> I was, sorry. Anyone, questions? I No? Okay. Um, no, I have questions, Aton. you already know. Um, oh, I so... would think, yes. <laughs> I just, go so... ahead, Sheila. So... I'm sort of a lay person in a way, and I want to make sure I understood the presentation. What I understand is you all are incentivized by a grant to follow the laws that are policies that have been created, um, the first point. And then through that is this um, council, great with the name change, and thank you for explaining that, Karen, and I'm, I'm very pleased that you're doing the presentation, that there's a name change to reflect what you're doing, because that's important and that you want to work with us more on these youth issues. My question is this youth council, who is on this? Who are these bodies of people? And are there specifically youth on the council? Most yes. people and people of color. And what does that look like? And I, I think in a general sense, if we could have part of our processes on this panel of understanding how people get on these councils committees or so have you you know this is being filmed um publicly and i know for me every day i feel like i hear about a new committee council board something that i've never heard about that's extremely impacting the livelihood of people who look like me and so um yeah can you tell us a little bit more about the demographics of the council please thanks absolutely and sheila that's a great question um and so uh, but first i'd like to comment on your your first point i'm i am appreciating how you put that um you know not all states choose to be a part of the jddpa or the it's now called the jjra um uh, Texas has elected not to be a part of this, not surprising. And actually, Connecticut only recently rejoined. And um, so it's this really interesting thing that if states um, don't want to meet all of these core requirements and monitor for the um, the four core issues that Elizabeth described, um, and then, of course, also have a council that is made up of um, a requisite representation from a number of places. And Elizabeth, I'm probably going to need a little help here because we'll, we'll tag team on this if that's okay. But um, it's important for us to have folks with direct experience um, on the council, which we do. And that for, you know, because this is youth work, this actually includes um, family members as well as um, 
um, uh, um, people who touch the systems themselves as youth. So we do have a parent and youth or people who touch this um, touch the system as youth on the on the council. We have to have representation from nonprofits, volunteers, um, the the defense bar, um, and um, victim advocates. I'm sure I'm missing somebody. Um, also, uh, folks with a mental health and or substance um, use disorder treatment background, just to give you a gambit, but it's a whole list of folks. Um, and actually, it you all might even appreciate seeing what that list is. And then in terms of getting on the, the council, we are very open to new members joining. Um, and the way to do that um, uh, is you can talk to Elizabeth or me about it, but also, um, this actually flows through the governor's office, and it's a matter of um, issuing a, a, a letter. And um, I, I think is it just a letter, Elizabeth? Help me out here, or or do um, they also need to fill out the the form? Yeah, I'm happy to put in the chat the application process um, for the governors. And if there's any questions, feel free to to shoot me um, any thoughts. Uh, you could. Sometimes we can encourage the governor's office to look just at a resume um, and um, kind of a, a cover letter per se, but typically they they want you to go through six step factors in applying for the board. Um, and I'll also say that we actually have um, this uh, one pager that we use when we're doing outreach. And I think that some of the information, Elizabeth, I'm thinking on the first page in particular, uh, would be really helpful just for this group to have. And then Sheila, you can see that breakdown. We have a little pie chart that shows who's who and how we have people represented um, on the council. And Julio's just dropped a lot of this also into the chat, so. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you. It's a little hard to see that. <laughs> And um, thank you, Karen. J just real quickly, is there um, a certain amount of like um, youth that you have to have? Is there a certain amount of people that you have to have or just representation from each of those groups? Um, we do have to have a certain number of youth and it, and it, and it depends on how big the council is. So um, we have to have a certain percentage. Elizabeth, I need your help again on the percentage. I can't remember. Oh, 20% needs to be youth. And yeah, that's a, a federal requirement as well. Yes. So like we, you know, we need to have this makeup to, you know, be able to do the work and to function in the way that we do. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If you all are asking me questions in the chat, I can't, I can't really read them um, while I'm on my phone. Right. What's uh, the, this is Christine, what's the age range for youth? Does it go up to like 20 something or? It does. It actually goes up to the age of 28. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. So it would be nice if is the have you do you have that letter to Martin penned? I do. Is it something that you could share with us? Absolutely. If you would send it to me, I would send it out to everybody so we could just okay. get a sense. We're gonna be talking a lot with him too, because we didn't, how to put it, there were a lot of racial equity impact bills that were impacted by that, and we saw nothing. Mm -hmm. We were kept out of everything this session, and it's not good. He agrees, and he wants to meet this summer. So, be, I mean, we're going to be hitting him, I guess, as you are, with a lot yeah. of this stuff, and it would be really great if I could start by passing that around to everybody and people could get a look at it. Yeah, that sounds great. And um, and like I said, um, we would be so open to working with you all. Um, uh, you know, we have incredible alignment, um, you know, in the recommendations that you all made. I mean, I would say 100 percent alignment on the recommendations <laughs> that you made on youth. Um, you know, it, it does help that Elizabeth is, you know, representing and helping to write those sections. But, um, you know, we were so excited that you all um, voted for such strong recommendations in the report. So, yeah, thank you for that. Great. No, thank you. I mean, I. It, to me, at least, it's become very clear that there's got we've got to do more collaboration on this sort of level to get the legislators to listen, because if they don't want to. They just don't. 
So, Rebecca. Uh, hi, Karen. Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, good to see you, Karen. Question nice to see you. Is I, I know that the council membership used to include a member from the Defender General's office, Bob Scheel, uh, but we don't have, as I understand it, a designated spot on that council from the office of the Defender General. And so um, we do. We do. Oh, we Paul do? Gross. Oh, got it. Thank you. Well, yeah. Good. So, uh, so that everybody knows. Um, so I think it's a little bit funny because I don't think he's received his official, um, you know, embossed letter. I don't really, I might be exaggerating on the embossed piece, but the fancy letter from the uh, governor has not been issued yet, but the governor's office did confirm with Elizabeth that he has been appointed. So he actually has started attending meetings. And I just have to say, Rebecca, like it's been, um, it's been great already uh, to um, have somebody who can help us read and understand the limited amount of data that we do have. So Paul's been a great add to the group and we we're really excited and just took, um, I'm sure everybody in this room appreciates this as well. It can sometimes take a minute for the appointments to come through, so. Sure. Sure. No, that's great. I, I knew that was in the works. Thanks for confirming that. Uh, I just want to second or third or however, put in my confirmation that um, the, the work you guys are doing is is really hugely important and uh, really relevant to what we're doing. So courage, um, regular communication. And it, it helps that we have uh, uh, someone from our office there. Um, so thank you. Yes. Um, Eitan, I'm happy to take one more question and then I have an engagement. Um, Understood. Anybody else? I do have a question. Oh, unless, I have a question unless there's someone else on the um, RDAP who- Go for it. We have a more pressing. Um, I'm curious to know if you have a time frame for the collection of the race ethnicity data um, and just the process, because, you know, we ORE is funded to work with ADS and state partners to strengthen the data infrastructure um, around these issues. And so I'm just curious to know, um, you know, I, I know you're open to collaboration, but also just trying to figure out if there's a time frame. And also, are your meetings open to where we can attend and kind of learn more about your process? I can take the last question. Um, that's an easy one for me, and I'll let Elizabeth help with the first one. Um, so our meetings are open, um, and you all are welcome to join. And um, um, Julio, if you wouldn't mind putting my email in the chat um, uh, so that people can reach out directly to Elizabeth or me, um, it's nice to know if you're coming, but you're also welcome just to pop right in. It is a meeting that's open to the public. Um, but if I know you're coming, I'll be sure to make um, time in the schedule um, to help orient <laughs> as we go. So I, I will use more words when we have guests in the room so that they can follow the, the action. And Elizabeth, would you mind addressing the first question regarding time period? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and, I'm, and I'm happy to, to go into as much level of detail as you'd like um, next meeting as, as well, or in August. I know that we have had a lot of conversations about data. So full transparency, the DCF presentation that we're putting together that we moved to August and was originally going to happen today includes all of that data that we also sent to the Fed. Um, so the, the Feds ask for an annual uh, solicitation to be responded to, and in that, they ask for an ERD plan. And we have to report on those five different contact points in that annual plan. Um, we historically have looked at um, an aggregate of three years and also separated out um, yearly. We do typically do it on the federal fiscal year just to be in line with, with the feds that we're sending it to. It's much easier. We have an MOU with the judiciary that sends, sends me spreadsheets. Um, obviously, there's a lot of limitations with the judiciary data set, which have um, caused uh, a lot of advocacy on Karen and the rest of the CUIJs stance for, for years about why having a quarter of the um, the data blank, per se, or, or unknown, is not only ethically troublesome and, and, and really problematic, but also legally we're federally required to be gathering this data as well. Um, 
And does that answer your question, Tiffany? So I, I'll be frank, I'm the one who puts it together. I just, I look at this Excel spreadsheet and I do my best. I would love to partner with you. Um, that would be phenomenal. Uh, that would be a wonderful additional boost to, to this work. Thank you. I think we would be happy to support. Um, we have a, a wonderful team at RE and I think the relationship with RDAP is really strong in terms of kind of guiding us in the work that we do. So I think it will be um, a wonderful opportunity. I'm very thankful that you all came to present um, and yeah. you know let us know more about what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and just a heads up for anybody who is interested in joining, um, we typically meet the third Thursday of the month. Um, and as it happens, um, we, uh, we will be meeting um, this month on June 20th. Um, but in the summer, um, uh, in July, we, um, we have a planning retreat. So we actually uh, will have our regularly scheduled meetings again, start up in September. Um, but we also have uh, committee meetings as well. So there's a lot of different ways that um, you all can tag in um, and just, just reach out if you're interested. Great. Okay, thanks again for having, having Thank you us so today. Much. <laughs> and I'm um, sorry that I had to be on my phone in the car. I hope it wasn't too dizzying for people. Um, so take care. Take care, Karen. Thanks so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. So there's that, folks. Um, as I say, I'll get, you know, once they, they all forward, the, uh, Elizabeth and Karen forward the letter, I'll send it out to everyone. Um, I'm imagining we're going to be hitting, uh, not hitting literally, but, you know, dumping a bunch of stuff at Martin um, Lalonde about uh, not only this, but of course, also things that just went wrong in terms of notifications that should have been made to the RDAP requests, those sorts of things. Um, we're still, I'm at least still smarting over that. And I think that that's been a problem. That was, it was just unacceptable. And um, he has promised that during the summer, we will work on thinking of ways to make sure that that does not happen again. And that will be also on our agenda this evening, given that we now have room for it because um Marshall Paul could not be with us tonight. Um, I am sorry about that, as I'm sure he is, but uh, we will take this up in August when both he and Rebecca will be free and be able to be at the meetings, and we will continue with that then. So bear that in mind. All right, um, moving right along, uh, I believe next, hold on is the approval of the main minutes. Uh, any discussion at this moment would be great. Anybody have anything they need to add, change, delete, anything of the sort? No. Okay, may I ask that everybody turn either their camera and or microphone on for the voting that might happen after someone makes a motion. What's what's that thumb, Dan? I'll move to approve the May minutes, Jessica. Thank you. Thank I'll you, Jessica. Second. Thank you. All in favor, please. Aye. 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 All opposed. All abstaining. Rebecca's abstaining. She wasn't here. <laughs> All right, but the minutes are accepted as submitted. And as usual, thank you, Grant, for the Herculean efforts that you put into preparing those for us. Grand. All right. Um, announcements. I realize this is a bit out of order. Uh, Chief... Stevens isn't obviously here. He won't be making it this evening. Judge Morrissey had a previous engagement. She won't be making it either this evening. Those were the two announcements that about uh, attendance that I wanted to put forth. Um, I have already talked about what we're going to do about uh, 
rescheduling the meeting that was supposed to be happening tonight to August's meeting and my regrets on that, but people lives get where they go, you know? Um, those are the announcements that I have at the minute. Um, does anyone have any of theirs to bring forth? Okay, see. Hey, Tom, this yeah. is Christine. I'm not an official member of the panel, but I would like to just let folks know that we're having a um open house at the Richard Kemp Center on Saturday. Is that okay? I guess I already did it. <laughs> Christine, can you put like all the relevant, you know, address or whatever, phone number, time, that sort of stuff in the chat? I will. I will. I have a flyer too. I could send to you if you want a ton. I would love that. Okay. All right. I good. would Thank absolutely you. love that. Do you have my address? I'm pretty sure I do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. I would love that. And I'll get that around too. I can figure that out. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let us move on. Um, one of the thing. uh, You'll remember, I believe this was the March meeting um, when I was sort of saying, I don't understand how we have these two equity impact assessment tools. I well, okay, I wrote it wrong um, um, in the state for use and one of them from the Office of Racial Equity and they don't get used by the legislature. That would at least have made me feel a bit better about what went on this session, but they don't get used. Um, you'll remember Coach weighed in on that, was equally dismayed, as was um, Representative R. Snow, who frequently comes as a sort of – she feels – it feels like a proxy to Martin Lalonde, even though he's not – really a member of the panel, but she's able to give him information that he needs. So that's where this next thing had come up, because if you remember, and I'm not trying to lock Representative Arsenault into anything, she had in that moment said that, that you know, that's, she'd be interested in that kind of legislation um, that would sort of mandate the use of the equity impact assessment tools. Um, and we were going to have some discussion about that. So that's actually happening tonight. And it will begin with um, Shalini. Shalini, I'm going to do this. Surya, Surya uh, Narayana. Am I anywhere near right? You definitely are. That was a valiant attempt. Thank and you, you were so, so close. We. I tried hard <laughs> <laughs> no, i felt it i felt it we actually do pronounce all of the vowels in india and but we group them a little differently than people do here so we say surya na rayana surya oh. Na rayana. oh that's so helpful thank you sure yes anyway <laughs> i i glad i got a lesson um, and you're going to be sort of talking about that tool and please go. I thank you so much. So I will tell you, first of all, so I am from the Office of Racial Equity and two of my colleagues attend your meetings regularly, Laura Carter and Tiffany North Reed. So I, I'm pretty sure you know them well already. Um I'm going to share some background information about the tool that um, Susanna and the Office of Racial Equity put forward. Um, it was originally called the Equity Impact Assessment Tool, but over time, it has been revised to be called the Policy Impact Assessment Tool, partly because, as you will see, the questions are geared more to um, helping people with a checklist of considerations when developing policy. Um, honestly, I think this can be used when you're developing programs or reviewing existing materials. Um, but um, for now, I'm just gonna focus on giving you an overview of how the tool gets used in terms of policy. And I'm very informal. So please, 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 if you have a question, something's not clear, you get an insight, anything, if you wanna speak up, just go ahead and 
and jump right in. Um, Laura is going to help me monitor the chat and raised hands. So if you if you don't just unmute, she'll catch it. Um, okay, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and try sharing. Let's see if this works. Um, okay. All right, are you seeing my screen yet? It's coming there. Yes? I'm looking okay. at the agenda. Oh, hang on then, sorry. Now is it showing up? No. Huh. Fill the agenda. Okay, let me stop the share and try this again. Sorry, it's taking me so long. <laughs> I'm there. much better in Teams. Yes, it's showing? Perfect. Okay, thank you, Eitan. Okay, so we're going to do the down and dirty, the quick version of the overview. But I originally made the slides thinking that I wasn't sure how much detail you would want. So I put a lot of detail in the slides and I made a PDF to give you so that you'll have that as a resource to look back at if you want. And I've also got some um, other resources that I want to uh, give you links for. I'll do that. I'll give. I'll send all of that to Aton in an email right after the presentation, um, so that you'll you'll be hopefully um, well resourced with information. So, all right, let's talk about the tool. Um, Actually, Susanna is the person I told you when in the early days when it was set up, it was called the Equity Impact Assessment Tool. And um, that has gone away. We don't call it that anymore. We call it the Policy Impact Assessment Tool. It's usually referred to as the IAT, but I also know that there's the Harvard Implicit Association Test that everyone always talks about. They call that the IAT too. Yes, so that's not what we're talking about today. Our IAT is very different. Um, so before I get into the actual tool, I wanna quickly give you an overview of three of our Office of Racial Equity values that are the foundation for every effort, every program, every project that we launch. Um, one is we believe strongly in process equity. So whenever we're creating or doing anything, we make sure that it's not just the outcome equity that we're going after, it's making sure the way we get there is also equitable. And hopefully you'll see that's a lot that underlies the whole impact assessment tool. The second thing is we look for structural solutions to structural problems. Mm -hmm. So rather than trying to come up with a one-off, that will address things in this moment. We like to build solutions that are gonna outlive us. Again, you will see the tool is all about helping people do that. And lastly, we promote transformative change over just transactional change. So another way people often refer to that is adaptive change over technical change. And um, I don't know if people are very familiar with that particular language that we're using there, but usually when it comes to technical change or um, transactional change, it's more of a black and white issue. It's a yes, no. It's usually um, it's usually driven by a um, like technical needs would be something that has to be programmed a certain way or designed a certain way versus adaptive or transformative change, which involves much more than just the technical aspects. And it very much involves your gut and your heart. And so these kinds of decisions and changes are much broader and more inclusive of many aspects of decision-making. Another thing I wanna quickly mention is that 
our impact assessment tool really is all about equity, even though we've taken that word equity off the front of it. I wanna ask you a question as a group. Anybody out there know what is wrong with the way this image is presented? So this is the most known image of equality versus equity, or this type of image. It's the most common one. What is wrong with this? There is something that we have learned over time that has taught us a problem with this image. Sheila's hand is up. Oh, yes. Tell us what you think, Sheila. <clears throat> well, I think that within these images, we haven't considered that, that there doesn't have to be a fence. Oh, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. And you're right, there are, there's been a lot of conversation about that, having the fence at all. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's a few small holes in the fence that people tend to look through. Those were created partly in response to that idea of why have the fence. That's a great point. That's not the one that I was thinking of though. That's, that's a, a very good um, idea, this, this whole concept of getting rid of the fence. But in this case, there is a problem with the image in terms of how the people are represented. If you look, you'll see that the person on the right extreme is much smaller than the other people. And it makes it look like the reason they can't see over the fence is they're shorter. And that's not why we have a disparity in who gets to see over the fence. This image is the new version. And if you see the ground actually gets lower, those have to do with obstacles and challenges that are put in people's ways that have nothing to do with themselves. These are external to them. Um, so I just wanna share that with all of you because again, this also comes out when you, when you are taking into account process equity, a lot of these things become more easily discovered. So this is my preferred slide for equality and equity. And as I said, we're shooting for equity in everything we do. So that means getting the right things in place to meet people where they're at, knowing that different people may have very different needs. Um, also wanna drop this in here. So when it comes to impact and intent and policy making, Here's something that the research has shown, the sting of intentional pain. And they did some research where they had groups of people receive equally strong electric shocks. They weren't actually very strong electric shocks. They were just equally strong. Um, and what they found out is if people thought that the shock was administered intentionally, they felt it hurt more than the ones that were administered by accident, even though it was the exact same uh, level of shock. So how we feel about it actually matters, meaning how we perceive that the harm is happening or why it's happening is just as important. Um, another thing that came out was that participants read about a CEO who cost their employees part of their um, paychecks because they made a bad investment. And they were told either that it was because he intentionally wanted them to work harder to make up for the loss, or B, because he just made a mistake. Interestingly, the people who heard that he did it on purpose to get them to work more, uh, they saw the loss as much more damaging. and employees in, in the second scenario where it was just an accident, even though the employees suffered the exact same objective financial loss, they felt that the loss was um, also more damaging. So again, when, when we, sorry, when it was a mistake, they didn't see it as damaging even though the loss was the same to everybody. So when they thought he did it on purpose, it felt more egregious to them. The bottom line is the tool is supposed to help us, whether intentional or not, from making causing harm. Okay, so here is the quick 
explanation of how the tool works. So this tool was designed so that policies and programs would be more successful. And to do that, we wanted to more fully define and understand the problem that we were trying to address before making a proposal to solve it. And that means clearly identifying how any proposal we come up with will result in the outcomes we want. Performance accountability. Um, that's essential for running effective programs. So we wanted to create programs and policies and then revisit performance accountability down the road. We not just revisit it down the road. We wanted to make sure we were considering performance accountability right from the beginning. So again, this tool will help us do that. Historically, policies were made based on the needs of people in the dominant groups. And that's part of what created the disparate impacts for marginalized groups. So if we fail to protect our most vulnerable people, that's going to impact our policies and programs. And ultimately it will hurt everybody. Systemic problems require systemic solutions, not individual ones. So shaping our policies and budgets to advance equity is the correct approach. And we don't, not expecting individuals to defy odds to kind of avoid negative outcomes or get resources. So designing systemic solutions. Equity is foundational to our work. We don't wanna create programs and policies and then sprinkle equity in as an afterthought. We wanna begin with that and make sure it's in place in the groundwork. A crucial defense against disparate impacts and policies and programs is to conduct equity impact assessments prior to making the budgetary or programmatic decisions that are gonna impact communities. All right, so these are the busy slides with more information than you need right now. So I'm just gonna focus on the part in the top. So the what, why, how, who, and when. And later, if you like, you can dive into those details, the examples that we have in there. So what is this? Um, we want people to complete and submit a questionnaire that focuses on the equity and continuous improvement implications of a proposed budget or policy proposal. So that's the goal of this impact assessment tool. Why do we do it? Well, the state's racial equity vision and values include one, pursuing systemic solutions for systemic problems, and two, transforming systems so that justice is built into everything we do. So we want decisions that are equitable and efficient, that create cost savings, higher morale, and smoother operations. So ultimately, by working towards equity, we will be working towards more efficiency, cost savings, higher morale, and smoother operations. How are we gonna do this? Well, the tool, it's a fillable PDF. It's got instructions built in, a glossary to explain terminology, contact information for people who have questions, as well as references and resource links if they need to know more. Staff would submit the impact assessment tool alongside any new budget or policy proposals. So it follows a standard review process all the way to the governor's office. And there's a short form version where we've identified the minimum number of questions that need to be answered for a first pass review. But if you want it to go forward for governor's approval, you have to do answer all of the questions. Who does this? Well, budget or policy staff complete the form generally. Um, and it's they often work in teams or collaboratively with other people to complete it. Um, we have equity liaisons. Our office, the Office of Racial Equity, has people in every agency in our state government who are called equity liaisons or ELs. And they are a point of contact between the agency and our office and between our office and the agency. So they're the perfect go-between. So if someone in the agency needs help with the uh, tool, they can route their questions through an equity liaison or they can come directly to us. Um, so in addition to our office, the governor's office and our chief performance office also support 
the work of our impact assessment tool. So they're also available to help. And when do you fill it out? Well, it can be submitted um, anytime there's a new proposal that's made. The volume definitely increases in the fall and winter when people are developing legislative priorities and proposals for the January to May legislative session. So it really ramps up during that time. There's a little bit of flexibility built in with the short form so that it helps people manage a heavy workload um, so they can get an initial review to find out if, if it's even likely that it'll go forward. Uh, so that shortens things up a little. And if it's going to go forward, they go in and do the full form. Um, so that's the what, why, how, who, and when. This is the what the tool is meant to do. So it's going to serve as a systemic examination of one, the theory of change and the assumptions therein that are in the proposal. So we want to know, it helps us tease out What's the theory of change behind this proposal? Second, it tries to examine how different marginalized groups will be affected by a proposed action or decision. And third, it looks at the degree to which we can measure, track, and align our proposals with our overarching goals. So it's pretty common sense when you ultimately look at the questions in the tool, they're very basic. They're more like a gentle reminder for everyone about how to include equity considerations all the way through your process. You can use the tool to minimize unanticipated adverse consequences in proposed policies, institutional practices, programs, plans, and budgetary decisions. You can also use the tool to maximize investments and staffing by anticipating needs, benefits, and harms. So we recommend that the analysis is, should be conducted during the decision-making process um, prior to actually enacting a new proposal. Typically, when people reach out to our office for input at the end stage of their work, they're less open to hearing our suggested changes because by then they've done all this work to get to a final version. So we're saying, please, please look at this early so that you don't feel like you're getting the rug pulled out from under you after you've reached what you consider a finalized version. These are the sections in the uh, impact assessment tool. There's a background section with questions about just the, uh, things that inform how your proposal um, is based, the problem definition, what is the actual proposal, who are the stakeholders and impacts, the resources that are required, and how will you measure and monitor progress and outcomes. So pretty simple sections. Um, I did not, I wasn't planning to go through, we're at about the 15 minute mark, and I was, yes, keep planning going. to, yes, keep going. Okay. So instead of putting in the questions, which you'll have a link to, so you can look through the questions, you can read them yourself. I wanted to take a minute to maybe walk you through two case studies about where, when we didn't use the impact assessment tool first, it came back to bite us. I think it's a more fun way to think about how this can save people a lot of time, effort, and actual uh, harm. All right, the first one. These are true, by the way. So we the this is a situation where a group didn't use the tool. It created racial disparity. So in Tobacco 21, there was no religious exemption in the Tobacco 21 uh, legislation. And that's the legislation that inhibits indigenous Vermonters who are under 21 from participating in ceremonial and ritual uses of tobacco. And tobacco is considered sacred. It's a sacred plant for a lot of indigenous communities, not just in Vermont, but all over. And um, it's used in purification uh, ceremonies and the conveyance of prayers. So a religious exemption was something that would have addressed a great concern for populations of people in Vermont who wanted to be able to use 
the tobacco for all members of their community during ceremonies. So the key questions in the impact assessment tool that would have helped to make that clear. One is, how will the proposal incorporate cultural concerns of specific groups? Meaning use of traditional healing practices, use of culturally appropriate diagnostic assessment tools, et cetera. So it would have keyed people into thinking about, that's right, who are the groups that might be using this tobacco? Uh, one other example. Did you meaningfully consult with community members in developing the proposal? If so, how? And if so, did those community members include persons of color? A generic question, but a real reminder to make sure that when we take actions, we are considering the needs of everyone, not just the majority groups. Um, you'll get the slides, you can read in more detail, but you sort of get the idea, you see where I'm going there? In this example, which I really like. This is a very, uh, yeah, this one was very troubling. So the use case, uh, minority and women-owned business enterprises. So there were recovery grants that were set up to help support businesses after the floods mm -hmm. and after COVID, many situations we've had these recovery grants. So in this case, a formal assessment equity assessment or impact assessment was never conducted when they were creating the process to hand out these grant awards, these recovery grants. And what they didn't realize is there was an existing disparity between business owners of color and other business owners who, who were, um, and this disparity was later acknowledged. So what happened was when they recognized that there was a disparity, they set aside money, special money, um, with an accompanying translation plan so that people who maybe weren't as good with English would have an opportunity to understand what was available to them. That was established, but it didn't get, it wasn't put in on the ground floor. It wasn't part of the original launch. And that's very problematic. Um, it sends all kinds of messages to our broader community. In this case, the impact assessment tool would have helped them catch that because it asks questions. Um, I'll give you an example. Will the public written materials generated through the proposal be translated? If so, in which languages? If not, why? Um, does the proposal seek to reduce disparities for marginalized or underserved groups? Boom, things that would have immediately reminded people to think about those types of business owners in the, the marginalized groups. So those are two examples where they were very public facing situations that um, where we had to go in and correct an oversight an oversight that definitely makes certain people in our community feel invisible, feel as if we don't think about them or take them into account. So important reasons to take the time, it doesn't even take a lot of time to do an impact assessment. And the more we do it, it starts to become second nature. In fact, as we develop proposals, we start automatically building those things into the process. In an ideal world, that's what should be happening. So Consistently requiring the use of the tool will build people's, what should we say, their equity muscles because they'll be using it more and more frequently. You know how when you exercise in the beginning, it really hurts, but then as you keep exercising, your muscles hurt less and less. I think that's exactly what will happen when people get used to using the, the tool more frequently and maybe in greater depth because using only the minimum question gets you to one level of looking at the equity concerns. But when you look at all the questions, it forces you to go much deeper into a more nuanced level of how equity impacts can show up. The SEC, the Social Equity Caucus, put together these probing equity questions. So it's very similar to the impact assessment tool. Um, it's a little, it's a simplified version. So I, I will share a link to that. I'm, I'm assuming many of you may have seen this already. 
Um, if not, I will make sure and share the link with Eitan. The other resource I wanted to actually call out is the Climate Action Council. Believe it or not, they created a sort of a final report and in it, one section, it was section four, created a list of the guiding principles they used for a just transition. They have a subcommittee called Just Transitions. So that subcommittee was trying to come up with a set of values or things to think about to make sure there's justice, inclusion, um, and equity in all the work that they're doing. And those are the main section headings. And I will share a link to that, the full report. And you can take a look at the guiding principles because I think they're a really um, great reminder. It's another type of reminder for what we should think about and how we should do the work. Not just the final product, but every step along the way and the actual final project. They should all be influenced and impact by these kinds of things. Um, I, I love this quote, uh, Curtis Ogden, the work for racial equity is about undoing as much as it is about the doing. We do not simply build new culture or behavior on top of old, especially in situations that are characterized by oppression. Some things must be released and this letting go does not come easy. And boy, I, I look at this quote a lot because in state government, many systems are designed to protect the status quo and to preserve the status quo. So, so much of the work we're doing, if we want to think about equity in it, it means we are gonna be changing things, changing things in ways where there may be all kinds of resistance. Um, you know, related to this is, anybody read that um, book, it's called, Atomic Habits, um, it's about how, it, it was written by James Clear. And in the book, he really is stressing how um, tiny changes or tiny habits can lead to these remarkable results. And one of the quotes that he said that I also have on my bulletin board is, we don't rise to our highest goals, we fall to the level of our most broken systems. And I think that's very similar to we are only as good as our weakest link, that sort of idea. So even though we might be saying all the right things about what we want, um, those high flying goals and expectations, um, they, might, they might actually be more aspirational than real. When we look at the reality of what's happening, we need everyone to take a much closer look and a much deeper look to make sure we're actually doing things in an equitable way. Not just the surface talk, but that we're doing the real, we're making the real changes to address those uh, systemic issues that were in place for all these hundreds of years, for these centuries. Sometimes we need to be courageous in, our, in changing our systems. Um, and Sometimes it's hard to say the things. So having a tool like this kind of does it for us. We don't, as individuals in state government, we won't have to try to push against the group, push against the existing way. A tool like this walks everyone through it. So we don't have to rely on an individual advocate here or there, or the one expert that's in one office so our Office of Racial Equity is right now five people to serve the whole state. Clearly, we're not going to be able to do it alone. So we need to set things up. Again, this tool is part of a systemic solution. It's something that if it's required, everyone is doing it every time, the right way, pushing them towards crafting things in a more equitable fashion if they're not already doing that. And even for the people who believe in it and are doing that, it's the great double check, right? It's the it's the backup plan to make sure we don't miss anything. Um, so that's that's kind of something to let you know more about what we've done and why we did it that way. And I am happy to uh, take any questions or um, 
stay for a few more minutes. I know uh, Laura and Tiffany will be staying and I would love to stay for a little bit of the discussion if that's all right with everyone. Um, Please. Okay, let me, how do I, um, there, am I? Yes. Uh, okay. Melanie, I shared two of the links in the chat that you shared in your presentation too, just so everybody knows. Oh, you're amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, questions from anyone? All right, I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> um, I am wondering how, let's say over the last couple of years, how many bills from legislators have come across your desks? Uh, we get involved, invited to participate from almost all the committees. So at some point in the process, we are invited to participate in an aspect or more of the development of bills and legislation. Oh, okay. So we, uh, let, let me just add a little bit to that though. That doesn't mean that we're involved at a good time in the process. It doesn't mean that people are open to the suggestions that we make. It also doesn't mean that everyone has always included us. Sometimes we've been included in a manner that's more of a check the box. And so technically they've included us, but it's it's definitely not real inclusion. It's not um, with the deeper intent of actually um, utilizing our expertise to help inform the work. So. I say that in a mixed way. I say that we're included in many ways by many groups because I think that's part of the reason that they removed the sunset clause. I don't know if everybody knew this, but when our office was created, it had a five-year sunset clause. And I, I, to this day, don't fully understand how we would go about or why we would go about launching something like this with a sunset on it. But, but that's that's how it was set up. And so luckily last year that was removed, um, partly because we were supposedly being utilized in so many areas of the work. Um, I will say that in terms of use of the tool, it is not being utilized. So our office shouldn't be the way that everybody tries to care about equity in the work. The tool is a much better way and it requires individual responsibility and accountability as opposed to the office being responsible for infusing equity into what's going on. The tool is actually something that grounds everybody in doing the work and includes all of us in being responsible for it. So the tool is a much better way to do it. The tool is only required to be used in certain types of legislation. So it's being missed. It is not being utilized in many other areas. Um, I think that's problematic as well. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, my answer went well beyond what you asked. No, no, it was actually very helpful because I'm, I'm trying to get a sense also of like flow that people create what ho would hope they'd read this and do it while they're writing bills. Right. But then after that, does the tool then go to ORE for review? It goes to the governor's staff. Okay. Review. So the governor's staff, if something isn't clear, will often pull us in. But we are not part of, uh, we are invited to do bill reviews. It's not, required right so we are able to give feedback and input uh when invited we we do bill reviews sometimes when we're not invited we submit them um but again how it's received is up in the air right um the requirement of using the tool though again would position equity into the process automatically so I definitely feel strongly that that would have great value. 
Thank you. Rebecca. Oh, I think you're on mute, Rebecca. Oh, thanks. I, I wanted to follow up on, a, on something you shared and to point to Julio's um, data point in the chat. He threw out some numbers as to the number of bills that have gone through the House and the Senate over the past two year uh, biennium, the most recent, uh, and how many were actually passed. And looking at just the numbers passed over the two sessions, that number is 216 bills. And you just said, if I understood you correctly, you have, whether it was invited or without invitation, uh, given these racial impact assessments on bills um, over the past two years? And if so, do you have a number and can we... I am sorry, I don't have that number, but I will get it for you. I will follow it up. I will follow up with a message to Aton and let you know. But it's a shockingly small number. I mean, the thing is, when we're brought in early with committees to look at bills, we give them a lot of that information. So that's not documented in the same way that a request for a bill review is. It's a it's sort of a very different level of um, request for input. Um Separately, as I said, we'll go in and testify when we see an important need, when we're not invited. So, I mean, I think what I could do is try to get you a list of how many times were we formally invited, how many times were we more informally invited, and how many times did we go in whether we were invited or not. That might give you a better sense because the having to go in without invitation is a sign of where we're seeing the lack of... Um, of uh, attention to those issues where it would have been very valuable. I and just want to add quickly to that response is um, <clears throat> that there were, we have a bill tracker as well. And so I don't know if that would be useful to, to share or to just kind of like gather data from, um, but there were several times where, as Shalini mentioned, we were reached, we were reached out to at the very last moment. So there's some, sometimes not very much thought as we, as we as an RDAP have, have experienced. And I also just want to flag that as far as bill reviews go, and this could have been updated in the last week, but our policy um, and research analyst, I believe they've only received three total um, for input. There are uh, some bills that we have provided or they have provided input um, without us being explicitly asked, but I just wanted to throw that out there as well. This session was very different than sessions in the past. I will say that the amount of involvement uh, that we've had was much greater in the past. Even though people were getting used to our office, it seemed like we were getting called in and consulted with much more frequently than this session. This session was particularly different than previous ones. All right. Sheila. Mm, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I absolutely loved it, speaking my language. Um, uh, you answered most of the questions actually that I had, which mm -hmm. was, um, but what I did want to ask, are there any, is there any, like, I want to drop names. Are there any legislators who are championing or interested or consistently asking and are using your tools and how can we support and making this happen for the beginning, I mean, I guess that's what you're saying is that you want to pass something to make this required um, so that this has to um, be in effect. And um, yeah, so how how more so can we support that and the work we do? I think it would be really important. I know we come to consensus, make a decision as a, as a group. Yes. But, um, I, I really like what is presented and do, I'm not shocked by how it is being underutilized and um it's just really unfortunate and for me myself i haven't seen those materials or even the materials from the sec so oh um, thank you thank you for sharing that absolutely the yes um thank you very much for for your comments and for your interest in how to best support um getting the tool to be more utilized um I will share with you a list of all the um, members of the SEC 
they are definitely big champions, allies, advocates for our work. Um, and they, I think that would be a group to work through in order to try to get something more formally um, put in place to require the use of the tool. So that would be a great starting point. And there are other senators and representatives who um, support it. But as a group, I think they're they're going to be the most effective way to reach the most people who are decidedly in support of this kind of a tool. So I'll make a note to make sure I include the list of SEC members. Oh, and by the way, the SEC is probably the only caucus, I think it is, yes, that allows community members to join, to be part of the group. And so some of the names you'll see in the a list of SEC attendees are not representatives and senators. Some of them represent different groups in the community, but they're very interested in inclusion and hearing all viewpoints and giving people opportunity to speak up about things. And that's why they allow community to come in. It's a blessing and a curse for the committee, as you can imagine. Uh, conversations can get very derailed, but it's their way of um, walking the talk and actually allowing anyone and everyone to come forward when they have an interest and in, in information about a topic. Okay. Great. Thank you. Rebecca. Thanks for uh, your willingness to share the information. We're really in an information void. Uh, I certainly from, as a representative of the Defender General's office and who was there at this, in the legislature this year and in past sessions, did also see a, a considerable change uh, in not being interested in hearing any information on this topic, period, whether right. or not, you know, not inviting RDAP uh, and things like that. To the extent that you were invited, can you also share details as to the bill and what your impact, your office's impact assessments mm -hmm. were applying the tool so we can see the substance? Are those public documents? Um, yes, I can share the actual assessments. Mm -hmm. um, if it's all right with you, I will include them in the materials I send. I just want to check with Jay, the author of each of those reviews. Um, I believe once we share them with the committees, they become public. Um, so I, I don't think it should be a problem, but I'll just double check with Jay. Um, and not all our reviews come up with a long list of issues and problems. Right. So it's a great exercise. And typically when we're invited, it's a great sign that people care about the equity impacts. I guess it's me. I have two questions. I have a fear that you all may not have the person power to go through the tsunami of legislation that happened this session. And so one concern that I have as I'm trying to think forward towards this legislation, which I think would be a great idea, um, would you have enough people to review? Uh, again, yeah. this is where we would like the model to be designed so that it doesn't rely on us doing the review. Okay. So I think what we want is to structure the proposal for this type of legislation around making sure our tool is robust enough that people will be doing the review on their own. They'll be conducting a review as they develop their proposal. And that maybe they would include that with the bill as exactly. It, it would have to be, yes. There'd be a requirement for that to show up with the bill so they could demonstrate how they addressed each of these equity concerns. And if they hadn't addressed it already, how it's built into the plan, how it will be addressed. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Sheila. Yeah. Uh, like, I just, I, I totally agree with that. Like, you all are being used and people are not doing their work, both individually and as uh, a whole body of a legislature together. Um, I'm wondering, do we have, and excuse my ignorance, but I'm wondering if we in Vermont have a statute or, or a policy for the legislature that they have to every year go through X training. 
um, or X, whatever, are there things that we currently have in place? And if so, is this one of the things we can add to that, modify, amend, build, something of that sort? And if not, why don't we have certain prerequisites or certain um, fundamental um, necessities in order to create legislation and policy that directly impact all of us? Why don't we have certain things that are required by the legislation to be trained, aware of, and something? So anybody can answer that question. I'm just, I'm really curious. I do know. Oh, sorry. You know, just I, a quick sorry. thing. I just want to interject. I know our office, Susanna has gone in to do an orientation or be part of an orientation for new legislators. Um, but it's so small and it's during the time when they're being onboarded. And so they're overloaded with all this new information about how to do things and who to know and so on. So I don't think it it can address, get nearly close to addressing the kind of thing you're suggesting. Um, I did put in a proposal to do some equity training for the legislative staff, because I think often staff might be another way for us to get this work into what's happening. Um, and they're receptive to that. So our office is going to be doing some training for legislative staff. But um, I don't know I, I also suggested it shouldn't be a one-off. It has to be a series, multiple trainings. So we'll see how that goes. And I just want to say, Sheila, I am becoming a huge fan of yours. You say all the things that I say all the time. <laughs> so thank you. Thank um, you. Rebecca, did you, is your, your hand kind of comes up and then goes away again? Did that? Uh, no, just... I, I, my point that uh, my most recent hand was in response to Sheila's question, but it was already addressed. My experience is the same. Initial orientation, too much information is thrown at them. Aton, you've been there to talk to them about our DAP and and including this past session, and it solves it does nothing in my opinion. Well, and I know that before she left, Bo Yang did a very broad mm -hmm. um, anti-bias training with them um and again it was sort of from what i gather you know people were kind of why are we listening you know this is in the middle of all this other information that we need and there was some frustration about it i don't know what yeah rebecca what, so what kind of informative Yeah, and in my opinion, unless there is legislation that says it's a required a requirement for every for every bill, it's it's going to be something where what we've experienced this past couple of sessions will right. just turn up. And frankly, I'm I'm um, and I think others on this panel, I mean, we're here having this this topic on our agenda because I feel like we are being made irrelevant. Yes. And maybe it's not even, I mean, it feels present tense. It feels like the past tense or this past session. Uh, what do we exist for if we're not being asked even to weigh in and um, they don't even want to listen, let alone implement. My question in terms of the questions that are being asked on the tool that you, that the OAE, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting the acronyms wrong. The of your office set forth. I know that there are other states that have implemented these kinds of mandatory assessment tools. Um, are the questions that you use, were they derived from those? Is there a model state out there doing it right? I know that Susanna did some benchmarking before crafting this version. Um, so I think she did take into account best practices from other states. That's one reason why I had mentioned earlier, I was surprised about the sunset clause. When we look about what's happening nationally in terms of offices that have been set up and how that work has informed the work of state government, um, we're definitely behind schedule. I mean, not I know not everyone agrees with the idea of having offices like ours, but um, it, it um, S similarly, the impact assessment tool, many other states do require using something like that. So I think when we look at 
the direction that things have gone in. The idea about getting some consistency in the type, the sort of quality control around the efforts, this is another way to help um, elevate that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am, oh, Sheila, go first. Okay, I'll try to collect my thoughts. I'm, I just want to make a statement. <clears throat> Earlier, you talked about, you said during the presentation, um, you know, doing the assessment doesn't actually really take that much time. And I'd say that's probably a yes and. I think for um, maybe people like yourself and I, <laughs> it might not take much, much time. But clearly with 100 and whatever, so many legislators um, in different opinions, perspectives, experiences, um, I think it will take a lot of time to grapple just around what is being asked, the understanding of it and time, um, time to most people or many people is a fundamental money. And then when we talk about time, the resistance I feel is not just about the time, but then once we do this, then that means we need to allocate more resources to that because we've figured out the inequities and so all oh, language barriers. So now we have to do interpreting devices or get translators or whatever it might be. And so now we have to invest more resources. And then that leads into really the basis of class and capitalism, which leads strictly into white supremacy culture. So I just want us to bring us all back to the grounding roots of what we're really talking about again. And I'm sure we all might know that, but I just wanted to have a real moment right now because that is what I feel like we're really talking about is, is that we are fighting up against that system and that system of class that has been coupled with racism to allow the perpetuation of the white supremacy culture that is specifically what we're talking about right now. And I, I feel like, you know, making um, some type of mandate is necessary and I really want to support that like ASAP. So let's let's do this. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> um you know, I and I don't know whether you uh, oh that's very fun. Um I don't know, Shalini, <laughs> whether you all would have like I'm thinking everything that you did in the presentation in some sort of verbal cover sheet for the tool so that legislators can read it because I know there are going to be people who are gonna be like, what? Like, what's this? Why do we, why, why? <laughs> you're, you're muted. I know. I oh, no, now so you're much. not. That in my last job, they gave me this mug. <laughs> yeah, I do that at least once in every meeting. So, um, yes, um, Susanna did, and uh, we recorded a webinar of her explaining how to use the tool. And she wants to, to refresh it. So she's working with the chief performance office. And wow. together, they're going to record this webinar. And she'll be back from her leave uh, right. coming up in the next few weeks. So I, I imagine that's going to be one of the items that they're going to pump out, the new webinar. But yes, that link is available or will be available. And it will be very easy for us to put that on the top of the tool. And I just want to also add that Sheila hit on something too, which is, uh, yeah, I think it probably saying that it doesn't take long to fill out the tool I, sh I, I should have said, answering the questions, if you're not familiar, it may take a little longer. You'll have to do more thinking. The part that really takes a long time is doing the things that they ask about in the tool. So, right? So they can ask, have you reached out to underrepresented groups in the community? If your answer is no, that's quick and easy. Right. When you realize you need your answer to be yes, then you have to think about it and then you have to go do it. So yes, 100 to what Sheila was saying, this tool is scary for a lot of people 
because it does mean more work. It does mean a, a greater budget that's required. Um, it does mean a greater focus on collaboration, on listening, on incorporating other ideas. So I I think it it can feel off putting to people who aren't used to those kinds of practices. Okay, thanks. Uh, anyone else? Um, yeah, my head's kind of full at the moment. I, I'm just, I'm sort of sitting and thinking, my fear being that the legislature may balk at having more to do. Yep. And um, how to get around that. How to get it. I mean, mandating it's the, you know, but you have to get them to the point of mandating it. But it's about quality, not quantity. Mm -hmm. You know, qualitatively, this is systemically really important for our yes. roots and for their needs. And so it's about having people understand like that equity and what we're talking about and how, you know, like what you were saying, it's like building that muscle or exercise or working out, whatever, it's gonna hurt at first. And I think that we all have to build that, we have to build our reps basically. Right. Yeah. I think you're right. And I just, I just like to say, you know, I don't know why I'm so passionate about this right now, but it's like so serious. Like, I feel like I even feel like dropping a line to my own representatives tomorrow. Yes. Like, what's up? And I think that I would encourage all of us to just call out to your representatives and be like, yo, what's up? And maybe that is a form of what we can do on this um, panel is at least do our due diligence and find out within our county, not even maybe just our districts, but in our county, what's up? What a good idea. That's brilliant. Damn. Yeah. I, oh, I like that. All right. Maybe this can be the start of, you know, I don't know how long we're all going to be on this panel, but maybe we can have some type of annual thing that we do before the legislation goes back to where we've informed our legislators on um, our concerns, our needs, things that we want to prioritize or talk about going into the next year's legislative session. And we're going to invite you to this meeting before the legislative session to blah, blah, blah you know, to meet with us and we're filming it. So if they decide to not show up, which we hope they will, um, then they'll at least be able to watch their two hour um, video at home in their P PJs. Right. Right. That's really great. Thank you. And we can maybe keep a tally list of things like this that we want to keep on supporting and holding our legislators accountable. Right. Right. I'm liking that. Shalini, you had your hand up. You're muted. Thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't have a question for the group. I just wanted to thank this group. I hope you hear it, but we believe in this group and we want you to know that we support this group and care about this group and really appreciate the work that you do. So I I wish there was a way um, we could wave that magic wand and get everyone to listen to RDAP. Um, I think you have so many important things to say. And I regret that sometimes when people reach out to you for feedback, they don't give you enough time. Right. Um, so it's not, again, it's, it doesn't end up feeling genuine. It's not a real, uh, so there are many ways in which I think uh, the it, it gets shortchanged, the input from this group. So I just want you to know, we very much believe in you and support you and appreciate how, how much you also support our work. So thank you very much. And thank you for allowing some time for us to share the tool and for caring about the idea of uh, making sure it gets used. Abs yeah. Now, it, 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 I think after the session, it just became very clear to us that, you know, we've 
often Mark Hughes is here and he's been very concerned as have we with the number of bills that went through um, and are currently sitting on the governor's desk um, and that there was no input from any social justice group within the state. The only possible exception, and it was very limited, I'm told, was the ACLU. Ah. And otherwise, not really. Um, and it's very hard not to be cynical and say, oh, look, they had racial impacts. They didn't want to hear about it. Um, and that's certainly how it looks to the communities. It's certainly how it looks to the community. I've heard this now multiple times from people that they feel like, well, of course they didn't listen. They didn't want to know. They didn't want, they didn't care. And I am not in a position to read minds, but that's certainly what the optics tell me. And that's got to stop. It's just got to stop. Um, and this was what we were thinking. And I wish that um, Representative Arsena were here to now, you know, to comment on this because she had. I I don't want to nail her and like make her committed to this, but she was one of the people who sort of said, "Oh, that would be interesting." And so I would really love to hear her comments. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, anybody got anything else that they need to ask or? want to ask or hey tan this is jeff um yes, jeff. you're aware that i um i think you are I'm, yeah. a, I'm about seven months after 20 something years on the board of the aclu in vermont I, and i am aware if you want me to reach out i think it's they've got a lot of volunteer I call them kids, but I call anybody under 30 a kid. <laughs> you might be able to build a bridge there. And if that should be the choice of this panel, you know, they can't, well, they can't we, hear me after 20 okay. minutes, They got to hear me. We are required by statute to, to interact with them, actually. Um, they look at our reports before we hand them in. They comment on them. Um, that's something that we're supposed to do. So I don't see that this is really significantly different. If we're really going to proceed with thinking about legislation in this direction, they're definitely going to be part of it. So yeah, I don't. I I I get that. All I was trying to suggest is that um you might be able to borrow a couple of young bodies to run ah. okay thank you sir right college is going to be over and um they get a long list of requests um, okay so that's that's all good thank you i'm being a bit obtuse this evening um Anything from anyone else? Shalini, no. thank you. You've started us on, on a, I think, a good path, a really good path. Um, Sheila, I love what you also came up with, like right to our, le you know, our, our legislators and sort of go, uh, hi. <laughs> um, what what yeah <laughs> i mean i think i'm gonna well we're in the same county doesn't matter they should get more than one letter yeah and i'll i'll be supplying you with all those links so right. you'll be able to have looked at those things before you reach out to them right. you'll be able to share those with them because some of them don't know where the tool lives yeah. and i um i will it's send summer, all... summer reading summer homework yeah. Maybe it should be a, a summer homework thing. Why wait until the legislation and then there's a check-in about it when you come in? Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We'll no, start, I think start that's... simple. You know, start simple. Right. That's great. All right. Um, I 
Shalini, as soon as you get stuff to me, I'll st I'll turn it around to the entire panel. Awesome. And um and we'll get going on this. I think that's a great first step, Sheila. And let's start there. I hope others are feeling positive about that. And just to be clear, I'm going to um, ask my legislators and then I'm going to ask, can they ask other legislators? Yes. Because I don't think we cover the whole state necessarily in, in the no. spider group. And I don't know who's going to be actually participating. Right. Um, but um, that we should ask them, hey, who do you think will champion this with you? Who will, you know, advocate, right. go to them, talk to them about it and keep on right. going. And. I yeah okay yeah never mind yes <laughs> yes um that's that for me constituted both of the following uh the two last items on the um whatever you call it um agendum I can't find it at the moment oh there it is um so, right. We, I think we did both the discussion concerning the tool from ORE and then concerning the legislation. I think we have a path. Um, it involves starting with these letters for those who want to participate in that. Um, and we'll pull some other stuff together for next month. Um, please send ideas to me. I have a few. I'm not sure that I've got them cooked yet. I will send out email when I have them better cooked. Please do the same to me. If you've got some really good ideas about where to go next with this, please send them. Um, all sorts of stuff comes up and I'd like to be able to put that out there. Um, anything I'm missing anybody? Okay, cool. Um, then moving on, uh, public commentary. Who's still here? Christine had to go. Um, that you know, Laura and <laughs> Tiffany and Charlene. Uh, you, you, oh, and you're you're the only ones here. Anything else you want to add? Okay, Laura, Tiffany. I was. I was just going to say, so um, I was fortunate enough to attend the um, Vermont Community Restorative Justice Conference at Lake Maury on Friday. And um, during the opening speakers, there was a an equity assessment consulting firm. And I know that Reverend Hughes has brought that up several times in our discussion. So I have not followed up with you yet, Aton, but it's on my list um, to circle back with you just to kind of lay that out as another consideration and suggestion as we continue our um, legislative conversation. Let's do a Teams meeting. Sounds great. Got it. Good. All right. Um, relevant known policy updates. There aren't any. They're on, they're on whatever they're on, sabbatical, or I don't know what they call it. There is the veto session on the 17th. That's right. That'll be fun. Expansion of restorative justice bill H645 was vetoed and that will be up for, you know, legislative potential override or not. Something else we didn't know about um, as a panel. Um, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, rel uh, no, hold on. New business. Anybody got new business? No. All right. Then I'm not going to go through that thing I go through. Oh, our next meeting is on the 9th of July. Um, of course, you'll get lots of email before then. And if nobody has an objection, I would say going home and having dinner would be a really good idea. Or you're at home, but have dinner. One other thing I want to point out, the... We're able to have open meetings, I, I'm sorry, online meetings until January. Um, then they're, they're like 
we can do hybrid after that. Um, that's a possibility. I need to look at it more. Um, I read a bit of it. I didn't read as much as I should have. Um, I just want you to know that this format will work for us certainly through the end of the year. Um, and then after that, I'm not sure how it'll work. There were parts of it that didn't seem to apply to us. I will keep looking at that. I will ask questions. I'll get as much information as I can. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there. That should have been in the, uh, what you call it, the announcements earlier on. So I'm sorry about that. So otherwise, it's been a lovely meeting and great to see all of you and to listen to all of you. And I'll see you in July.